like I said, working shift work for years there, I would I would have those 12 hour night shifts where you just sit and stew and you come up with ideas and, but you wouldn't act on them. And uh, this was the first time we kind of acted on something on doing something on the side. It was just one of those things that there's so many things that we wouldn't have learned had we have just sat and researched and thought about it and tried to come up with the perfect plan to launch this side hustle. Just by starting it, we were able to, to learn more than we ever could have just based on research. So, Well, hi there and welcome to Side Hustle Hero, the show that is laser focused to inspire you to take action to start or to scale your side hustle income streams. I'm your host, Joan Posse, author of The Way Success Works. Today, we're delving into the world of co-hosting short-term rental properties. The startup cost can be quite minimal as you don't own the properties, but rather you're solving potentially a lot of problems for the property owners and you have the opportunity to serve and profit from both them and the guests staying at the properties. Sean Parker fills us in on the details. Together with his wife, Jill, they currently co-host 52 properties and look after in some capacity, close to 65 properties, earning them gross revenues in the high six figures. Sean tells us about the revenue and expense side of the business, the downside of co-hosting that people don't often talk about, and what's currently more profitable, owning a property yourself or co-hosting. Sean has the data and has crunched the numbers for us. And it's an interesting business model. Let me know what you think. And by the way, if you're enjoying what you're seeing in this podcast and you'd like to buy me a coffee, it's a fun way to show your support. It really is a thing. Just go to sidehustlehero.com forward slash support. A large soy latte could come in really handy right now. Thank you from the bottom of my coffee cup. Now here is my conversation with the founder of Simple Hosts, Sean Parker. Well, welcome, Sean. Thanks for having me. I appreciate the invite. While I've had guests who have talked about their Airbnb businesses, this is the first time that we're going to be focusing on co-hosting as a side hustle. So tell us what that is and how did you end up becoming a co-host? Oh, I love that question. We got into it based on uh, purchasing a property. Okay. We did that back in 2020, right when kind of COVID was kind of taken off. We put the offer in the spring of 2020, just up the road from where we lived. And then it kind of built from there. So we bought that first one, enjoyed doing it. My wife and I were both working full time. So we actually had a, a new baby in May of that same year. Oh, wow. So my wife was the rock star there. She was the one bringing the baby, doing some cleans on the side while I was stuck at work. And Okay. And uh, yeah, so we loved it. Ratings kept kept coming in. We were, we were doing a good job based on, on that. And uh, my father-in-law and mother-in-law actually purchased the cottage right next door to it. Oh, and uh, asked if we would kind of do the same. And uh, I was going to oh, ask sorry, you how, okay. that's okay. <laughs> I was going to ask you what gave you the idea to get involved in that in the first place. So it was them? For the co-hosting, yes. So, so we were doing the hosting ourselves. And then, uh, yeah, once they purchased that property and asked us to, to kind of help them with it, they're honestly about six feet apart. Right. So, it, yeah. <laughs> so that was kind of our, our introductory to co-hosting and, and having somebody to answer to. What gave you the idea and, to get uh, involved in a rental property in the first place? You're both working full time. You've got a baby on the way. I think COVID had a lot to do with it. Just kind of like uh, it almost introduced like the, the fragility of, of what you did. And it was just the idea of mm. having a second income kind of made sense. Just you never knew what, what tomorrow held and right. if your job was still going to be there. We had decent jobs in the area. I was working at, at a local refinery. As a process operator, my wife was a full-time hairdresser and we were doing, doing very well, but I just, you didn't know what, what the future held. So yeah, myself, I don't know for not being a business, business major. I always had like a, an entrepreneurial mindset. I always, I, my wife could attest to, I always came home with new ideas or you'd work in our shifts at work were 12 hours. We did, we did shift work. So. You get lost in those night shifts if you're just working the control board or working outside and right. just, you, you get an idea in your mind, and, and, but there's no one to, to share it with. So you come home and my wife would bear the brunt of, Hey, <laughs> I think this is, this is something that's missing in our area. This is a business idea or 
So this is just the first one we really acted on and we purchased that property and, and yeah, the rest is history. Great. So you've got that one going and then your relatives ask you to look after theirs. How did it grow from there then? Were you focused on acquiring more properties yourself or you thought, huh, maybe this co-hosting is something. So describe actually what co-hosting is as well. So for us, co-hosting is, is more of a, a property management. Once we took on that secondary property, we're still doing the same things we're doing hosting. Yes. Where our title just was different. I think I have a lot of data now. We're averaging about 50 turnovers per place per year, both working full time wow. and just, just the messaging. I think at that point we're you're sending and receiving about like seven to 10 messages a day okay. in the two properties. So it's just one of those things. It was just enough to ruin your train of thought <laughs> yes. um, over the course of, over the course of, uh, of a day. Yes. So uh, while, while you're both working full time, it was, it was one of those things like, man, I, we got to figure something out here. Right. If we're going to keep, keep this going as a, as a side hustle. And we actually put out a, an ad for uh, just local cleaners because it was just too much for us to do. Well, our big thing was we didn't want to hinder ourselves at how many turnovers we could do or the minimum right. amount of stays. We wanted to act almost as a, as a, a hotel on wheels, kind of, where guests could kind of go to either property. They knew the level of cleanliness they were getting, the, the response time for messages was going to be the same no matter what. Almost like you had a front desk. Yeah. you. I mean, you want and, those five-star uh, ratings, right? So that's exactly. all part of well, it. That's what right? you, you live and die on, especially in those algorithms. As far as like Airbnb and VRBO go. Mm-hmm. So if we didn't want to lose out on our, on our ratings or, or our level of competency. So we reached out to a, a local cleaner and kind of explained what it was. So yeah, this part of Southwestern Ontario, Airbnb was still in its uh, infancy. Okay. Even in like late 2021, early 2022. Okay. Not a whole lot of competition in our area. So we explained to the cleaner kind of how it worked. And cleans could come in kind of seven days a week. It was sporadic. You had from 10 to four to, to get them turned over. Yep. We had the, the schedule kind of set up uh, automatically. So she was going to see the cleans come in. We also only had like a one day booking window. So they could That's come tight. in last minute. And so we found somebody that was on board with that and Great. she loved it. So she was a residential cleaner at the time. Perfect. And she couldn't get over the the cleans, the level of respect that the the guests had had for the most part, and she would walk in and out and get a good clean done, and between like three hours per place, like she could do a really good job. Place was turned over immaculately. Wow. So she asked, she jokingly kind of said, "Well, you got any more properties that you're hiding from me?" And <laughs> it kind of that was like the spark that that kind of ignited it all. Yeah, just in discussion with. <laughs> people I worked with and stuff like that, whether they had uh, long-term or midterm rentals, or maybe they were getting into the Airbnb space. I just kind of said, Hey, I've got a cleaner. She's doing a good job. She wants more, more cleans in this, in this realm. Right. And uh, yeah, so I, I actually (laughs) not at the time, but now it's our our next door neighbor. They were the first to kind of say, Hey, we have this one just up the road from where you are. We're doing it ourselves, both work full time, going to have a second kid. Would she want to look after that? And, and that was kind of, kind of the start of it. And then since then we went from, from June of 2022 until June of 2023, we'd hit 45 properties. We went from three to 45 and then we're approaching 65 now. And wait, you're looking after 65 properties now. Yeah. We host ours and then we co-host for 52 and then we actually operate a uh, a short-term rental specific cleaning company on as a as a realm of that too so of course you 15. do yeah <laughs> so we have another 10 to 15 units depending on the year or time of year that we uh clean for and, and do some minor property maintenance for Okay, so there's uh, three elements to this now. There's the original income (laughs) property. There's the co-hosting or really what, as you described, is property management. And then you've created a cleaning company as well. Yeah, so that's kind of of a branch. We're trying to build consistency because I'm sure your way to, you see that uh, you definitely have uh, like a seasonality to the business. Yes, especially where you're living there. 
yeah, being on the shores of Lake Huron, like we have like some of the best freshwater beaches in the area. And right. It explodes for four months. Like I think, I don't know if the data backs it, but Grand Bend, Ontario has a population of like 2,200. Okay. But uh, sees an influx of about 50,000 wow. a weekend yeah. in the summer. So Jeez. I think Grand Bend alone has 330 Airbnbs okay. and it's got, like I said, it's got a population eight months of the year of just over 2,000 people. Right. So, so it's one of those things where we were very busy. We had 1,100 turnovers in 2023. Wow. So, but about 850 of those came between June 1st and Labor Day weekend. So and you were it's hopping. one of those things. Yeah, we had 22, 22 to 24 cleaners at that point. And so it's a matter of trying to keep as many of those on. Sure. Throughout the off season too. So we're just trying to build that cleaning aspect of the, of the company as well. Are the two of you still working full time? Neither. No. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, we're both, <laughs> both doing this full time now. Um, nice. Okay. I jumped in April of 2023 and my wife was shortly thereafter. So. Right. So yeah. during those super busy times then, during that summer season, you're probably all hands on deck and I would imagine jump in sometimes when needed. Oh, definitely. We were still doing, still doing cleans the odd time this summer and uh, sure. we still are now. Just, yeah. it's one of those things where uh, anything you do is, is I need it now, whether it's, it's own, like hosts, owners, guests, like it's all. Yes. Uh, yeah. Everything's on a time crunch. So. Sure. Cause to them, like for the, from the guest perspective, this is their holiday. This is, this is a really yeah. important time for exactly, them, Exactly. Right? Cause you want the, uh, and. You have your hiccups here and there, but you want yeah. the time that they pretty much book. You want uh, everything to be set out. They want to know that when they leave their their Toronto home or wherever they may be coming from, that they have their access code. They know what to expect when they get there. Photos are on point. Yep. And uh, and then to boot with this kind of with the property management um, aspect on the side and and more boots on the ground. We're looking at kind of making it more like. A, when they, someone books a simple host property, they know what they're getting. They're going to get the, a quality bed linen, a quality towel. The place is going to be immaculate. Right. Um, photos are going to match exactly what they, what they arrive to. Really creating your and brand the there. Of, yeah. It's just, it's kind of like making it, I, I, I myself, we book Airbnbs all the time. Or when you're traveling, or, you mean? Or wherever we can. Yeah. Yeah. And we, something we noticed was lacking was, if the short-term rental space was going to miss, it was going to be missing on the, like the expected level of quality that hotels might have. Just mm. the fact that when they, it, it's easy to operate a hotel, all things considered, when you have everything in house. And so we're trying to bring that level of consistency to, to Airbnbs and short-term rentals. Right. And just to clarify, Simple Host then is the name of your company. Yes. Yeah. Yes, it okay. is. Okay. <laughs> How extensive then is your involvement in the property when you're co-hosting? Like, what do you look after for the homeowner? I'd say there's about three, three aspects you, we monitor as co-hosts. And the first being guest communication. Okay. And, and responses and, and laying out automated messages for them from booking before arrival, during stay, before checkout and after checkout. And then we do dynamic pricing that we use a uh, pricing algorithm for. Okay. And we also monitor their calendar. So we ensure that it's up on Airbnb, VRBO, Google Vacations, booking if they decides, decide to as well as simplehost.ca. Okay. And for the dynamic pricing then as availability drops, the price goes up. Yes. Yeah, yeah. For the most part, that's, uh, that's how it works. And then there is a point where it will dip as you get within like six to six to 10 days out. If it's still not booking, then it's we, book. it's trying to drive occupancy. And that's all done by the platform. Yeah. After you set it up. Yeah. Well, if something yeah. goes wrong, then I don't know a pipe bursts or if something goes wrong in the property, the guest contacts you. Yes. And uh, that's kind of set up uh, sporadically based on the owner's wishes. We do have some owners that are investors and they have 
they might have boots on the ground in the area. We have a couple that just have like a guy that they, they trust and respect and they want to use that okay. as a, as a property maintenance side of thing. And then we also have others where if we're not able to have simple hosts on location. So right now we have ours in kind of Southwestern Ontario, but we do also co-host for a few properties in the Muskoka Lakes region. Okay. And which would be, we don't actually have. Which would be like a couple hours from you? Yep. Yeah. The nearest one we have is about four hours from us. Oh. So for properties like that, we source or outsource locals, whether it's finding local handymen or women, local electricians, plumbers, HVAC techs. Right. Um, and then we also source with two to three cleaners slash cleaning companies in the area um, that we bring on to our cleaning scheduling platform okay. and they they see our bookings through there and that kind of gets done automatically yeah because i would imagine that's probably one of the biggest challenges then is trying to do something long distance like it's yeah, much easier mo- if you're in the area if, if there's no one around to deal with something you can jump on it right away right exactly and we yeah. have the and we have the hands in a local area right like we have the us as well as other employees and managers and right so but uh, yeah, that was the biggest learning curve we had was to, to figure out to be co-hosts in other regions. But so far, so good. Yeah. I think you want to make sure that you're set up for success right off the get-go. And when you take on that property, you don't want to be trying to find local companies or individuals at the time with crazy. Right. You want to, for sure. You want to have those people in your back pocket before something happens. So that's been our, our biggest thing. And we actually are able to to operate this as a as a remotely uh, easier and easier the more we take on sure when as those months and years tick by too you know that experience builds and exactly you get more efficient at it as well yeah and what are we looking at then as far as expenses that you have i guess it depends on what you're doing for a property if i'm just co-hosting or our dynamic pricing model, I believe, is six ninety nine US per month per property. So there's one expense to list. We use HostAway as a preferred property management software. Sorry, that's the platform charges yeah, you. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So sorry, Price right. Labs okay. is our dynamic pricing of choice. We've tried a bunch of them. Price Labs is their favorite. We do that. Yeah, six ninety nine US, I believe. So is this what isn't we're something right that now. this isn't something that's done automatically within the Airbnb platform, for example. No, we've done no, the Airbnb okay. smart pricing before. We just found it didn't move fast enough for us. Okay. Because they are a, a channel manager first and, and those are kind of the secondary components of them. Okay. So we chose Price Labs, which is dynamic pricing first. Oh, okay. Because our big thing that we found in the last probably 18 months is the growth of Airbnb and short-term rentals in this area. Mm-hmm. Like I said, when we started in 2020, they're... I, I think we were probably 10 kilometers from our nearest one, maybe five or six at the most, like at least. Wow. Yeah. So we didn't have the competition and you could put it up on Airbnb at almost whatever price you wanted and it booked and we it booked a lot. Right. But now as competitions come in, in a, in a good way, it's, it's forced us to get a little more creative and we've kind of pivoted to a more revenue-based occupancy model rather than occupancy-based. Explain that a little this, bit, if you would. Yeah. So in the beginning, it was just, it, it, occupancy was, was so easy. We sat at about a 60 to 70%, which was a lot for a very seasonal based area. Yes. But the big thing was it, we didn't really care so much about the pricing aspect of it. We were more just like, it was just, we had people flock into it. So it didn't really matter what we had the price set at. Okay. Uh, now we're kind of playing a game of setting the occupancy more at like a 40 to 50%. So we're not, it's not uh, driving your price down to be the lowest common denominator, right? You're, you're okay if some places are getting booked at a hundred, 150 a night. Okay. As long as your big weekends and seasons are getting booked. Sure. And that's kind of what we're, we're after. We know that from June 1st to about the end of September are going to book. Yes. You can sometimes make our owners and hosts a little uneasy <laughs> to not see to not see a book completely booked by the end of April, early May. Right. 
but uh, you just have to assure them that it will book. And it's more letting the demand come first before trying to be ahead of the demand. Okay. The pricing algorithm is, is set up in a way where we're okay if we're not the first one booked. Right. If we know that we're going to get booked that week or weekend. And then right. the algorithm will, will see the bookings coming in across the market. And then okay. we'll see some steps up in our pricing. It's just, I know because we've had a few owners that have hosted for a few years now. And I think mm-hmm. they were used to the, the 2019, 2020 days, especially early COVID where people couldn't travel yes. abroad so easily. And, yeah. and local Airbnbs was, was the vacation of choice through those lockdown days. Right. And yeah. it, they just saw so much occupancy and it, it was just a really easy side hustle. Yes. Like anything that the market caught up to it. And right. It, it's not set it and forget it anymore. It's, uh, it, it is a business model. And right. yeah. there are professionals like, like us and that are, right. that are in the market now. And that's, this is what we do. And this is, this is what our whole business is built around. So yeah. you got to get creative in, in your marketing tactics. Yeah. And so using that uh, algorithm that you just described, you just assume keep your prices a little bit higher because the revenue is going to be there. Even yeah. if it's rented for less number of days yeah. overall, right? And, yeah. yeah. And then in the, the yeah. off season, the ones that do stick it out through the winter, we will, we'll change, almost flip the model completely to an occupancy base. One of the big things is just keeping warm bodies in the home, right? Right. It's for sure. Especially when you're on the property management side of things, you know how easy with our cold temperatures here in Ontario, that uh, something going unchecked can result in the catastrophic failure in a home. So yeah, you want. People just in just there. having people there all the time is, uh, is worth its weight in gold. So absolutely, it's 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 more important to get occupancy at that time of year than it is the mm-hmm. dead of summer. Well, talk to us about earnings. How are you paid by the client? So we try and keep things pretty simple. Okay. And we charge a a ten percent co host fee. Okay. And that's just on the base nightly rate. That's your base, like I talked about before, the guest messaging, the getting it listed in all the platforms, syncing up the calendars, right. monitoring the pricing. And then we also, on top of that, we'll charge per clean, just start market rates set by our cleaning staff or right. if it's a place up in Muskoka Lakes set by the cleaners themselves, Okay, the separate companies. And then we also, if it's something that we can service around here, then we'll do with the property management as a la carte charges for snow removal, lawn guard maintenance, just any, any minor fixes. And then we'll also look after, if it's something like that, we'll also look after sourcing professionals if they're in need of like an electrical upgrade or repair or plumbing issue, heating heating and cooling. So you'll almost be the general in that way and sub out the actual work to whoever. Yeah. yeah. And then, so those are billed out on our billing platform. Okay. We'll, we'll invoice to the hosts or owners. Right. So you're getting a, a piece of that as well then. Yeah. And then uh, we found that was the easiest. Uh, I've discussed it with other property managers or co-hosts in, in some of the Southern states and that, and a lot of, a lot of the going rates there are all in pricing. So it's, like 25, 30, 35% of the total. And then they'll look after cleans and, and just about anything. Right. The big thing around here, maybe because we're kind of new in this realm, in this part of Ontario. Okay. We had a big pushback. I think because there's so much variance in the properties around here. So you service push, any pushback from pushback what? the all in pricing model. So the 30 to 35%. Okay. They liked the the 10% plus billing for expenses on cleans and, and items such as those. Okay. Which, you know what, as a as an owner myself of a property, I, I understand that. Wanting to see it more itemized like that. Yeah. So we yeah. service everything from boutique hotels in Grand Bend okay. to three and a half, four million dollar cottages in Port Frank's Grand Bend with sprawling front yards and back onto Lake Huron, right to the beach. And so right. the, there's just no level of consistency on 
what owners might need to service their property. We can, we go up to like 10 acres of, of lawn that some of them have that need cutting and, right. and some of the places might be a two bedroom cottage on the lake or a seven bedroom country property or it's just, so I understood that sense that, okay, like I want to know what I'm going to get charged for cleans, what lawn maintenance is going to cost, what snow maintenance is going to cost. Right. And then uh, we were able to be able to break down our co-hosting to like a general 10%. It's going to work out for us. It's going to cover the costs of, of listing it on our platforms while also controlling the day-to-day aspects of the, the guest relationships. Right. And that would be pretty transparent from the client standpoint as well, because they would have access to the platform and see those numbers. We like the transparency with the owners. Mm-hmm. So we allow all owners and, and hosts access to, obviously they have the access to the Airbnb right? as primary or co-host, depending on how they want to be seen. Yep. But we also allow them access to a host away owner's account, which is their property management software that we use. Okay. So that they can see their properties, their financials, guest communication. And that comes in really handy. Uh, a lot of our properties that we service are family cottages. It's one of those things where maybe they bought it right before COVID or they bought it during COVID and now they're looking at it and they're like, COVID, the, the bills have gone up, taxes have gone up. Let's, let's help offset those costs and rent it out but they might be three, four hours away. Right. So that's kind of where we come in. Um, yep. But it's nice because they're going to be in and out of their own cottage. So instead of having a conversation every time that they want to go to their own cottage, right? they, they can see they have access to the calendar. They can put in something we call an owner stay. Yes. Um, which will still trigger a clean or any sort of maintenance property inspection that might be right. associated with getting the next guest in there. Yeah. And it so just makes it easier for them. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So they're, it's not like they're giving up the, the, the property. They can still use it at various yeah. times. And but what you'll find when you have that is owners, it, it's, it's their second home. It's, it is their own property. So they might change things. They might forget to tell you that they've, they've changed it to a natural gas barbecue. Or uh, maybe they brought, it, they brought in this, old, this new couch or stuff like that. And for our hosting team, if they're going to be messaging guests about items, if they say, hey, is there going to be a gas barbecue there? Or is, do you use, do you have a fire pit? And our host team says, no, no fire pit. It's easy for the owner to be like, oh, shoot, I didn't, I didn't really to tell you about that. (laughs) We actually added a, yeah, a natural gas fire pit or, or something like that, or a fire table there. Yeah. And then we can, we can update our, our listings appropriately, pretty handy. So are most of your properties now at that 10% model then? 10% yes. of the, the, the nightly rate? Yeah, we have a, a flexible rate. Um, just as an example, one of the boutique hotels, we, we also kind of monitor the clean, the cleanliness and the uh, common area maintenance um, of that okay. hotel. So it's not just the Airbnb specific units or right. the short-term rental specific units. Um, we do oversee that it's got a fourth deck rooftop, rooftop patio with hot tub and and barbecues and stuff like that. And so we do like a, a 12 to 13% on that, or it's just, it's a negotiated rate for items such as that. Right. So you've got all these other add-ons then over yeah. above just the base rate. So what size is your company now revenue wise? Yeah, in 2023, we saw um, a revenue of about just under 600,000. Revenue. Gross, gross revenue. But in saying that, we probably, we didn't see our 40th, 43rd property up and running until about the middle of August. So we, we probably only had about half the properties up and running for half the year last year. So we're forecasting about uh, eight, 800 to 950,000 this year, right. um, depending on the amount of turnovers and yeah, yeah, we're, we're looking at about 2,100 turnovers this year. And so from that gross revenue then, expense-wise, you've got the platform fees that you described. The cleaning costs have to come off of that as well, right? Yep. Yep. Cleaning costs, depending on if we service the, like, the exterior of the building or the property or not, we have those expenses if we're 
subcon- subcontracting a company. Is there, uh, a, is there of, a percentage of net revenue that you're kind of hoping to hit or, or what your target is? Yes and no. Based on kind of how we operate our, like our, our net on the subcontracted events, mm-hmm. we normally aim for, depending on the, the time and energy or the, the cost of the bill, like 10, 10 to 40% on those. And then obviously we have our, our 10%. Our expenses on the, the hosting side of things are pretty low. For the, a lot of it, Jill, Jill and I still take it. We oversee a lot of the guest communication. We have a lot of it automated. Uh, we just see the one-off. We just respond to the one-off right. requests. Yeah, because I know and, with those platforms, yeah, so, you can send them yeah. the codes and the directions and all that is automated. Exactly. That, so it's yeah. it's something more unique, like, you know, what's the best restaurant or what, like something, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. And okay. even that, like we, we have digital guidebooks. Right, that, of course uh, you do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That, yeah, that if they get there, there's a, there's a QR code that they can scan and yeah. it'll show. Yeah, we, we opted for that yeah. both to, to save paper and supplies, but it allows us to adjust them Yeah, remotely, which instead of going and printing a new, a new pamphlet every time that a restaurant changes or, right. or maybe you right. run into a couple of bad experiences with a, a restaurant and guests are like, hey, this shouldn't be included. Like it's gone downhill fast. Yeah. We can just log on to our guidebook and, and change it instead of having to go there, change out the whole binder. and Right. Nice. I'm intentionally not asking you for figures about a s- specific property because I'm thinking in terms of the, the listener getting involved in this as a side hustle, you know, that revenue generated from that property, it's going to depend on so many factors. Just like so you mentioned, like the $4 million property versus the $100,000 condo, right? Exactly. So I think my, what would be more helpful is what expenses perhaps have come up that most people wouldn't think of or that even surprised you? For the most part, our expenses are offset by the, the owners, right? So, right, okay. But we do have the one-offs. We've had like se- septic system backups. Those can get pretty pricey. Right. You get into like flooded basements. It depends on your whole structure. So we kind of, we just in turn take the quote that we would get from the, the subcontracted company and right. build our own quote. And then we're going to send that off to the owners. Right. If you're going to, if you're going to eat that cost and then expect a payback from the owners, that would be a large expense that you might sure. not be expecting. Yeah, you don't want to do that. <laughs> I, I would not suggest doing that. As far as, far as like. If you're just talking co-hosting, there's not too many. I would say the big ones, like we have the, the property management software, which is what 30 bucks per property that we list with host away. Okay. Like I said, we had the, we had the price labs, um, depending on the property, we like to use uh, remote locks for automating the guest code Yes. for their arrival. Yep. Um, I'm trying to think of any others we do use virtual assistants to help us in, in off hours for guest communication. Who, who pays for all the basics like toilet paper and tea and coffee? We build that into our cleaning fee. Okay. We found that uh, that was... I see. Okay. So we built that into because it's, it's, a, it's a funny business. The co-hosts are the other front and center of like to the guests. Yes. But I always say that like the... The company is really run by housekeepers. They're they're like they're your like front lines of running the business. They're going to be the ones that that notice the deficiency first because they're there all the time. Right. They're going to be the ones that you could have like the the four million dollar like front home compared to the like you said hundred thousand two hundred thousand dollar little studio condo in Grand yeah. Bend. It doesn't really matter what you offer them They're like first impressions will be the cleanliness of the yes of it i find that that cleanliness rating if you took a, a graph of uh, the cleanliness rating to the overall rating that a guest gives your property i bet it it coincides almost directly or correlates mm. almost directly i just find that that's that's where you're like where you're going to get that that five star 
rating right. of your property. That's a um, really good point, Sean, because some people getting into this business not might pay as much attention to that critical role, that cleaner. I airbnb a property for a while. I was putting it up for sale. And before I, I did that, I was running it as an Airbnb just until I was selling it. That was the intention. And yeah. I was so thankful that on the ground, because the property was about an eight-hour drive from me, the person that did the cleaning, she was absolutely amazing. Her background was, and, and how I had met her was in the Japanese martial arts. And I remember one day going into the property and I'm like, Midiam, how do you get the floors looking so clean? <laughs> like there's no streak on there. When I do them, I, they don't look like that. <laughs> yeah, and she said, oh, a... I do them Japanese style, like on my hands and knees and, and, and with the rag. And I'm like, okay, okay. <laughs> that's, that's, that's over the top. But I also had her like bake cookies, fresh cookies, fresh fruit there local coffee, all of those things. Like you said, that that cleanliness and that first impression when you walk in are just so key. And literally all our ratings were five star. And I, yeah. I attribute so much of that to Midiam. Oh, I, it's it's totally up to the, the housekeeping ability of your of your property. And that was honestly one of the things we've we've actually played around with like contracting out cleans. We've been a company for like a corporate corporation mm -hmm. for about 16, 17 months now. Okay. So we're still, we're learning every day, but we, we toyed around with, should we be having this contracted out by a professional company and stuff like that? And I, we noticed a, a severe decline in the cleanliness rating. Mm -hmm. When you have your own people and they're, they're back to the same property each and every time, or, or for the most part, whatever we can get in the schedule. Right. They're going to, they're going to notice those little things that, that a company or a corporation might not. Right. Um, and and they're you've, gonna... got, you've got direct control over the company culture then as well. And, exactly. And, and, and what you're paying right and bonuses people. and incentives and, you know, however you yeah. want to structure it. So it and actually does the, make sense. And if you're the first person that they can contact or like their our cleaning manager is, they're going to be able to say, hey, I, I need this or I think we should do this or and like these aren't coming off of the fridge. I'm going to attempt this. Can you bring this material to us? And just, just stuff like that. And I think right. like, that's like, you can't even, you can't put a price on that. Like, yeah. And that's where like it, we play around with the, I know Airbnb is, is on the forefront right now trying to phase out cleaning fees. But I, my biggest fear with that is I, you're not going to get the same like cleanliness ability or, or, or quality for those shorter stays if if they're only going to be staying like two three nights which normally was offset with the cleaning cleaning fee it didn't seem yes. so daunting yes you might toss somebody in there that's only making 18 19 dollars an hour that might not care as much as right as, as the cleaners making more that have been doing it for 30 years or we have some that uh, that have had their own companies and in, in kitchener waterloo or or the GTA and, and they've been unbelievable, just little tips and tricks that they can do for both efficient yeah. and just general abilities when it comes to cleanliness, just things that you wouldn't know unless you experienced it yourself. Right. And, and that ability uh, to, to give you a heads up on things that need to be fixed or suggestions to make it better or, or right. Exactly. Just keeping that yeah. dialogue open and, and we, we've seen a number of improvements that have come from the housekeeping side of things. So. That's if I were to, that'd be one of those points that I'd make to a fellow co-host that you can answer within seconds. You can provide all the automation the guests need. You can have perfect pricing. Calendar will be synced like within seconds. Mm -hmm. You can have perfect listing photos, all these different amenities. Yes. But if that guest arrives there and they notice marks on bedding or the floor wasn't done right, or maybe the dishwasher is left full of dishes or maybe offer a spa or hot tub and it's not Working perfectly or, clean. Yeah. Right. So yeah. these are all those little things that if, if these aren't met, it won't matter. It won't matter your five-star communication rating, your, right. your check-ins 4.9. It's, you're going to, you're going to eat the overall rating because they're going it, to, it's just a, an easy sticking point. Right. And it's something right. that is just as humans, I think we were able to notice very easily.
I think you've already touched on this, but what's the downside of the business? What don't people talk about? I would say when we first got into it and we had our first property, it felt like a lot, but not that much because we only answered to guess, right? It was our property and we only had that group of guests that we had to answer to for their stay. Mm -hmm. Once you get into co-hosting, you're now in a, mm. almost like an operational sandwich, right? Yeah. So, so you've doubled it now. <laughs> you've yeah, got so, two parties. <laughs> so you've, you've kind of almost got two different parties paying you for your service. You've got the guests paying you for their stay. And then you've got the owner also expecting like a level of competency that their needs are met. And it's like, well, don't let the guests do this. Or maybe it's like, I, I think we're missing the mark here. It's you, you've got two people to answer to, right. two different, like with very, very separate ideologies, but very similar, almost like it's hard to describe, but yeah. they both want the very best out of the property, but they want to take different routes to get there. Right. Owners want to get there like efficiently, economically, but they also understand that like the business runs on algorithms and that we need those five-star reviews. We need those, those glowing numbers. The, the photos have to be spot on. Yes. You're going to have to offer those little things just to, to ensure that the guest is like the most enjoyable stay possible mm -hmm. where the guest doesn't care about anything in the background. Right. They're there on vacation. Sure. They're there yeah. to relax. They don't want to be worrying about any number of items, right? They want to, they want it to be a flawless experience. And yeah, so it's, it's trying to balance both those to keep both happy because at the end of the day, you need both of them to be a co-host. You need the property first yeah. to list, and then you need the guests to come there to continue listing it. What is so, more, and I think I know the answer to this, but what's more profitable, you owning the property yourself in, in short-term rental or co-hosting? That's a good question. I would, I have run the numbers on it. There is something to be said about owning our own property. We're in a bit of a, an operational niche where how we're able to operate our own um, property while being, this is our full-time profession. Right. It does one of the best net revenue wise in our portfolio. It's also one of the oldest. The place that um, you and, own. Yeah. So yep. it's as yep. not, it, not in, it's not the oldest. It's one of the longest listed. Yes. So it's got, it's built up a huge backing and you get a lot of repeat customer, like right. stays in the summer and, and off season. So that's helped. But I think we have the ability to operate it the way we want it operated, mm -hmm. which a lot of owners don't because they may live like you, like your example, eight hours yes. away. Yep. So they're kind of at the mercy of locals or, or companies like ours. Yeah. But we don't have anybody in the background telling us that this is, we need this minimum or this pricing minimum, or don't let somebody book three nights in the summer. They need to book at least five, or it's just, we're able to operate it kind of very efficiently. And I, you've got the ability to test out things too, that you might not yeah. want to test out on somebody else's property. Exactly. You can do it. You've got it as a test case. All things considered. The, the margins would be higher as a co-host than as a property owner, um, especially with today's housing prices, especially as we see in, in our geographical locations in Ontario yes. and BC, um, we know that the pricing just skyrocketed. So mortgages are higher, rates increased, taxes went up. We have yep. a lot of legislation that we have to deal with now. Well, I wanted to um, ask you about that. I was area. kind of surprised that... Airbnb wasn't a huge thing, even in, in, in 2020. Has there been like pushback and more regulations and, and bans coming your way? So just show how in its infancy it is in our area, the township that we live in and our 
our rentals are like our own rentals in still doesn't have any short term rental bylaws or okay laws. So you in haven't place. been affected that yet, then? No, they're coming. We've actually been contacted to help assist in the drawing of the bylaws. Us and another company in the area and a couple of local Airbnb hosts. Right. As well as local residents. We all are residents, right? We all we all live yes. somewhere. Yeah. So for me, the whole idea of let's not put any laws in. Let's put like we had some people say that, like fellow hosts, and say, Oh, I don't I don't want any bylaws. And to that I kind of said, Well, we all live somewhere. Right. And like I've actually in our first Airbnb, we lived there for a few months and we lived next to the second property, which was an Airbnb. Right. So I, I know firsthand what it's like mm. to live next to an Airbnb and, and have maybe guests there that might not want to shut it down at 11 o'clock or right. might be just having, having a good time out of the campfire or. Right. So you have and to man, understand that, that like. And man, that sound carries on a quiet night, right? It's such like, it's such oh. a fine, fine line to walk to because you don't want to shut down. To me, I don't, I don't want to shut down business and side hustles. I feel like they're just being in the space. There are a lot of good hosts out there that, especially the ones that live where they host, they're doing such a good job of a lot of it. In our municipality, we have no hotels and motels in our mm. entire municipality. Wow. So almost the entire waterfront, barring some local conservation lands and community parks is completely residential. So okay. there's no, there's not a whole lot of ways for outside people to enjoy our waterfront, right? which is like, we have Grand Bend has been in the top 10 for world sunsets for really? dec decades now. I think in 2008, wow. National, Geogra National Geographic ranked it number one for world sunsets. Very and cool. So it's like, who else is going to enjoy these, these beautiful views or the vast, like Great Lake expand like expansive view that you get yeah. so to us it's like when we bought the first airbnb we wanted people to enjoy what we get to enjoy in this region yeah so this was the only way that they can do that by booking a yeah. cottage on the water and right so it's nice to have think, everybody at the table like that to get everybody's perspective and so you probably won't come up with a perfect solution but to incorporate all those different opinions i think it'll yeah. be really helpful in the end and that's where we're reoperating Grand Bend. Like that whole municipality came out with one in 2023. And I, I like it a lot. They have a, a bylaw enforcement group in the, the seasonal months based solely on short-term rentals. So both neighbors and guests have a number they can call if there's something awry with their rental or their neighbor's rental or the guests that might be next door to them. Okay. They have a, a fee that's supposed to go towards funding the, the bylaw group. And then they have just a number of items that you'd expect in a hotel. You must have like a site plan, fire escape plan, wear extinguishers, carbon monoxide detectors. Right. Safety features um, like that. Exactly. So that's yep. where I look at stuff like that. And I'm like, that, that makes sense for our realm as property managers and co-hosts trying to offer a simple host model of a hotel experience to all guests yes. at all of our short-term rentals, that makes sense. What can we offer that is going to be like with safety in mind and local residents in mind, what's the, the best uh, meet in the middle? And I found that that's one of the best we've dealt with so far. Right. That's great. <laughs> you've, you've experienced pretty explosive growth. Where are you finding clients? That's, that's a good question. It started as word of mouth. Once we got to the first couple, it was just a matter of, th there wasn't too many around us. In the grand scheme of things, I'm sure a lot of Canada would look at us and be like, I'm going to use the root word for moat in Southwestern Ontario. And we're going to be like, get out of here. <laughs> but as far as like Southwestern Ontario goes, we didn't have anybody to provide this offering to us. When we got our second property and before we hired that cleaner, I did reach out to some of the bigger companies, like bigger North American companies that kind of do okay. property management and co-hosting. Yep. And I provided our address and I felt like I was laughed off the phone. 
<laughs> oh man. <laughs> and it was like, yeah, we're not going out there. Right. And so it was one of those things where I was like, I, I, if we did this, like my wife, my wife's name's Jill. Yeah. Jill, if we do this, like, I, I don't know who's going to compete with us. In the, and there are some locals that have been doing it free Airbnb and VRBO days of just like your local, you call up the local number and say, Hey, we want to rent this place in along Lake Huron in the shores of Grand Bend. And they're still out there and they're still doing their thing. But what we wanted to provide is almost like a, like a remote co-hosting experience for these owners where they, they could feel a part of it in as big or little a way as they see fit. So right. whether they, we have owners that have messaging lot of notifications as co-hosts or hosts just completely turned off. We don't, right. don't bug us. Just send us, yeah. send us the bill, send us the money yeah. and we're going to block off and we want to go there. And, yeah. but uh, yeah, it was, it was providing that kind of experience where they could look on their phone and say, oh, our place isn't booked this weekend. Let's go there. Mm -hmm. But where we find clients, it started as word of mouth and it's kind of continued there. Our big thing is I didn't, I, I'm going to say this kind of jokingly, but we didn't want to grow too fast mm -hmm. and explode too much that we weren't providing a service. And I still think there are barriers right. we're seeing right now oh, as a young company, we want to improve on and we don't want to grow too fast that we actually haven't spent any money on marketing yet. We built a website. And we made it very simple to just put your information in to get a hold of us and we'll reach out to you. Right. We didn't get too expansive there. That's where we kind of look to grow in the future. In other words, kind of work towards operating more remotely. Okay. Just yep. to increase the marketing aspect of the company. But for now, we've hit the 60 properties or so based on word of mouth and base Google searches. And that's... Right. That's kind of all we've done. And we haven't spent any time and energy on marketing just yet. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Well, what's the best way for our listeners to connect with you, Sean? You know, one of the best ways would be at our website, www.simplehosts.ca. That's okay. hosts, plural. You can find us on Instagram. Our handle is Simple Hosts. You can search us up on Google, Facebook, all the same Simple Hosts Property Management Corp. Those are, the, those are the best, best avenues to find us. And, Great. Uh, we'll, have and yeah, we'll have all those links. We'll have all those links in the show notes. No problem. Awesome. Yeah. So what's your best success tip for someone wanting to start or grow their side hustle since you've been doing both? <laughs> oh, that's a, I love that question. I would say, well, it's, it's going to come as a, I mean, I feel like everybody uses it, but, uh, but just start it. Like I said, working shift work for years there, I would, I would have those 12 hour night shifts where you just sit and stew and you come up with ideas and, but you wouldn't act on them. And uh, this was the first time we kind of acted on something on doing something on the side and it's turned into, it's no longer a side hustle. It's our full-time profession and, and we're learning. And it was just one of those things that there's so many things that we wouldn't have learned had we have just sat and researched and thought about it and tried to come up with the perfect plan to launch this side hustle. Just by starting it, we were able to, to learn more than we ever could have just based on research. So I would say my biggest thing would just, just start it. Just if you have yeah. the time, you have the ability, what we did upfront cost didn't cost us a whole lot. We were able to start it with for mere like tens of dollars a month to get started and, and get going based on the softwares that we use. And, and yeah, that's, that's the big thing. Just get started. And, yeah. and if it doesn't work, it doesn't, it doesn't work and maybe move on to the, the next idea. But I think you're going to learn way more just by doing and getting, getting it off the ground. Any regrets about no longer having those 12 hour shifts? <laughs> sometimes you know what there's those there's those days where you realize that you're the person that needs to act on these decisions especially now yes. that we have a, a bit of a workforce and stuff like that and it's like man i sometimes i miss those I, it wasn't really a nine to five but those those employee that mindset of, of going to work and leaving work somebody when else's you, when problem you head home and <laughs> but you know what 
the flexibility that's created in, in time and balancing work life. I, I don't regret that at all. I wouldn't trade it for anything. <laughs> Thank you so much, Sean, for sharing your insights on co-hosting and the growth of your uh, company. And congratulations again on that. And thank you for being today's Side Hustle Hero. Right on. Thank you so much for having me, Joan. I, I really appreciate my time on here. Take a look around you and realize that everything you see, the thing you're sitting on or the material you're standing on, the items you're surrounded by, began as a single thought in someone's mind. And once they had that thought, they continued to think about it. Those thoughts grew to form an idea, and then at some point, they acted on that idea. That's how everything starts, as a single thought. Then you build an idea and then act. One of the things that lights me up so much is hearing someone share the story of how they came upon an idea for their side hustle and then how they took action to start it and grow it. It's so inspiring. Imagine how Sean and his wife, Jill, feel now, having created a six-figure business, and looking back at the day in the kitchen when they were both still working full-time and thinking, should we do this? Can we pull this off? And then taking that critical step, deciding to act on the idea. It changed the course of their lives. But there is no guarantee that it would work. Many a side hustle has ended up in a loss and closing down. But as so many of our guests have said, Sean included, we learn so much by doing. So here's to having the courage to act on our great ideas. Well, that's a wrap for today. You'll find links to the websites Sean mentioned, as well as his contact info and the show notes at our website, sidehustlehero.com. If you're enjoying what you're seeing in this podcast, I'd be so grateful if you would take a moment, add your comment, share the episode, and please subscribe. It'll let others know that there's valuable content here to help them start or grow their side hustle. Thanks for watching and hustle on.